Right, on to our penultimate poem, Checking Out Me History, by John Agard. And, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just getting distracted by my phone. I'm being absolutely dreadful. Um, yes, this is one of the poems that won't quite sound right when I read it out, because I do not have a delightful Jamaican accent like John Agard. But that's one of the key points about this poem, by writing it in this way. Agard is forcing us to acknowledge his identity and his accent. Um, and so I'll try my very best not to be terribly offensive when I do read it out. Dem tell me, dem tell me, what dem want to tell me. Bandage up me eye with me own history. Blind me to my own identity. Dem tell me about 1066 and all that. Dem tell me about Dick Whittington and he cat. But Toussaint Louverture, no, dem never tell me about that. Toussaint to slave with vision, lick back Napoleon. <laughs> Sorry. Toussaint to slave with vision, lick back Napoleon battalion, and first black republic born Toussaint to thorn to the French, Toussaint to beacon of the Haitian revolution. Then tell me about the man who discovered the balloon, and the cow who jumped over the moon. Then tell me about the dish run away with the spoon, but then never tell me about Nanny de Maroon. Nanny, see far woman of mountain dream, far woman struggle, hopeful stream to freedom river. Dem tell me about Lord Nelson and Waterloo, but dem never tell me about Shaka, the great Zulu. Dem tell me about Columbus and 1492, but what happened to the Caribs and the Arawaks too? Dem tell me about Florence Nightingale and she lamp, and how Robin Hood used to camp. Dem tell me about old... <laughs> dem tell me about old King Cole was a merry old soul, but dem never tell me about Mary C. Cole. From Jamaica she travelled far to the Crimean War. She volunteered to go, and even when the British said no, she still braved the Russian snow, a healing star among the wounded, a yellow sunrise to the dying. Don't tell me, don't tell me what they want to tell me, but now I'm checking out my own history, i carving out my identity. <laughs> oh, that wasn't too appalling. Now, um, contextually, Agard is a poet, he's still alive, in Guyana, which was a British colony till 1966, a part of the British Empire, um, probably still part of um, the Commonwealth, but I'm not entirely sure. So when he was growing up, he learned British history. He didn't learn about um, Guyanan history because it was under British influence. He had to learn about things that happened in a small country, um, many, many miles away, that seemed to him to have little bearing on his everyday life. Well. That's not quite true, but I mean, the cultural references, um, you know, far removed from his own um, uh, history, uh, local history, so to speak. The intended audience of the poem is um, is basically teachers. You know, it's it's sort of written for schools. Egard wants us, us being the white ruling class, as it were, to think about how we teach history, how it needs to be inclusive, and how none. Eurocentric history is also needed and valued and important. Um, Agard remembers reading in a history book um, the following line, Indian history begins in 1492. Um, Indian, I think, referring to the West Indies, not, not, um, not Asian India, that is. But basically, um, this history book says that history began when the Europeans arrived. Um, obviously, this is an imposed history and it neglects um, all of that rich cultural tapestry which came before. Um, many figures in the poem are to do with the British, which shows the strong influence of Britain on um, Afro-Caribbean Afro society, but also vice versa. Um, Creole, we've talked about this. This is the dialect in which the poem is written, and Agard is taking pride in language. Um, the dialect is a protest against British authority, and Agard is deliberately forcing the reader to acknowledge his own identity. This is something that Agard um, <clears throat> wrote. He says that the poet keeps us in touch with the vulnerable core of language that makes us who we are or you are. Heartfelt, vulnerable, fragile, complex. Um, the, sorry, the heartfelt, vulnerable, fragile, complex, contradictory nature of the human beast. <clears throat> and this links to the sort of contradictory nature within the poem itself and the competing voices, which we'll look at in a bit more detail. Um, however, in spite of all this, there's that theme of unity and that sense of wholeness, completeness, um, community, almost. 
Um, there are, <coughs> well, tied in with the two voices, you've got sort of the white stanzas, which talk about British history, and then the black stanzas, which focus on um, black history. And in these black stanzas, the bits in italics, um, a lot of the language revolves around nature, and therefore this sense of freedom and positivity. The poem itself is a conflict between um, the past and the present, between people, time, nature, one's natural state, as it were, war and healing and place. So it covers many, many themes. In terms of form and structure, this is a modern poem with quite a strong form and structure, which uh, is somewhat rare. There is a very regular rhyme scheme, which is repeatedly used to hammer home the message of the poem. It also makes it more memorable, a bit similar to Blake's London. Agard here wants the figures to be remembered. The poem is written as a counterpoint of two voices. One voice speaks in nursery rhymes and quatrains, while the other is celebrates historical characters, specifically black characters. Um, well, figures, I should say, written in a rhyming list of historical facts. The stanzas always end on historical black figures, so this is important. This is Agard bringing our attention back to what matters to him, the sense of regaining um, and educating um, his own history. <clears throat> educating, teaching. <laughs> A bad choice of words. Um, enjambment is used throughout um, to sort of blend this combination of black and white, merge them together as though they belong in the same sentence, showing a sense of um, uh, unity. Alternatively, it may show anger and passion that he's not stopping to, you know, think he's not pausing, he's not using any commas, he's just dashing out these lines one after the other in uh, almost a sense, sense of um, righteous anger. Uh, there is a restrictive form in the first stanza particularly, it's uh, rather repetitive and that might mirror Agard what he feels um, to be his restrictive experience in Britain or the restrictiveness of the education system. The quatrains, um, as ever mentioned, they act like a nursery rhyme, they're playful and they have the rhythm of the calypso, this percussive rhythm. And they're cheerful and when Agard reads the poem out, he sort of sings it. Um, however, they convey a very serious message. Um, this sort of playful element it stops as being hostile to his message if Agard was just going to attack, say, a white audience and, and um, you know, sort of, it, it might make them more defensive. But the fact that he's sort of playing with them, it catches the reader off guard and it makes us more susceptible to his message. Um, the italicized verses, on the other hand, they sort of become a little more serious. They intersperse the poem, introducing a new voice and unstructured rhyme. And then it's in these stanzas that uh, we get a little more of Agard's true message. And then he goes back to being a little bit playful, sort of teasing us almost. The Calypso, generally, um, it is a political music form, often including social commentary. Um, it uh, covers themes of sort of freedom, unity, it's imaginative, and it originates from um, Trinidad, so it's sort of this uh, Caribbean background. When talking of black history, um, the form of the poem, it suddenly becomes more relaxed, more spontaneous. It's written in free verse, which shows how uh, personal freedom is linked to cultural freedom. So you've got these, um, I wouldn't say strict quatrains, so to speak, but there's definitely a, a stronger sense of rhythm and it's a little bit more um, structured and ordered, whereas the italicized stanzas, they... Um, they suddenly become a lot more free because that's that's what really matters to Agard, this sense of um, freedom and almost uh, escape from the restrictive nature of uh, white society. There's a lack of punctuation throughout the poem, um, which is Agard standing against British rules, essentially. He's doing his own thing. He's refusing to accept enforced restriction. And that may also, um, however, mirror the confusion Agard feels about his own identity, perhaps because of British rule in where he grew up. Um, and maybe this is why all of his ideas are sort of blending together without any very clear structure, because he's trying to work things out and trying to achieve some sense of freedom. <laughs> oh my gosh, my phone does keep going off. Um, Clearly tremendously popular tonight. Um, the childlike rhyme scheme, um, 
for the white stanzas may also act as a sense of mockery, a sense of Agar teasing um, a white audience, perhaps in contrast with the more serious, uh, one could almost say more sophisticated black stanzas. In the black stanzas, the italicized ones, um, well, the italics itself uh, serves as emphasis. They, they literally stand out in terms of visual effect. They're written in free verse. Uh, it's as though Agard is, you know, um, presenting himself as a free spirit, as um, black cult, free, sort of freeing black culture, perhaps, and saying how all of these people he's talking about, they were free spirits as well, um, living really fascinating lives in spite of all the restrictions that were placed upon them. Um, they're very short lines. Again, you could link this to the sense of righteous anger, perhaps. Um, it's almost as if he's, you know, rattling out these, these short, punchy lines uh, to increase their effect. And um, the form of the poem generally, particularly in the you know, whole Calypso sense, it's, it reflects oral poetry, which, um, again, is uh, a black tradition, I do believe. And um, the final rhyming couplet, um, it acts as a happy ending. There's that sense of hope, which serves as a change from the anger, um, the angry tone at the very start. OK, so we'll go into the language in the next video and um, you will probably get to hear me do my wonderful rendition of the Jamaican accent again. <laughs>